multidisciplinary speaker today. Um, if you could, please, um, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and, uh, and uh, give you the screen. Um, I'll, I'll just br briefly introduce um, this group uh, to you, and then I'd love to have you sort of introduce uh, yourself and, and kind of what your goals are in your practice, and then, um, get, you know, and then uh, pr provide the presentation that you prepared. So thank you for being here. Th this is the, uh, you know, the, the CU Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Program. So online is a combination of uh, our foot and ankle faculty, uh, physician assistants, um, uh, athletic trainers, uh, physical therapists, uh, and then our orthopedic residents and fellows. Um, so it's a very engaged group, and, and this group is all focused on uh, on foot and ankle, and we have administrators on as well. Um, so we'd love to to kind of hear from you, and and um, if there's time for discussion at the end, we'd love to engage in that. Um, but thank you, uh, thank you again for for being here and for being our multidisciplinary speaker. And you're, you're muted, my friend. Sorry. <laughs> Jonathan, you're you're muted. Okay, there Can we go. Everybody, hear me now. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for having me here today. I, um, it's a pleasure to present to you about rheumatology for the foot and ankle. Um, I'd like to start off by uh, thanking everyone for giving me this opportunity. And um, I just moved here from Colorado, from Boston. Uh, and everyone here has been so friendly and nice, and I love the mountains, and I, um, I'm looking forward to getting to know everyone here a lot better and working closely with everyone. So I practice in Cherry Creek Medical Center. I'm part of UC Health, um, and I uh, specialize in musculoskeletal ultrasound, which I learned from my rheumatologist uh, mentor at Massachusetts General Hospital, Mina Kohler. Um, and so uh, I use a lot of ultrasound in the diagnosis of rheumatologic disorders, and I'd like to kind of share all of that with you today. So I'm going to uh, start the presentation. I don't have any relevant disclosures for this presentation. So the objectives of the talk today is I want to identify common diagnoses that are seen in rheumatology in the foot and ankle region. And then I want to integrate some diagnostic pearls that I think that you would be able to incorporate um, uh, as orthopedic surgeons and foot and ankle specialists into the diagnosis of rheum rheumatic diseases and when to refer to me or another rheumatologist uh, for foot and ankle diagnoses. Um, I want to also uh, show how to approach the treatment of certain rheumatologic related arthritides of the foot and ankle um, and what to do first um, before referring to rheumatology. And then I also wanted to discuss the advantages of the musculoskeletal ultrasound that I do a lot in my daily practice um, and how helpful it can be uh, versus an MRI um, that we order a lot. So the common rheumatic disease diagnoses that you can see in the foot and ankle are one, the most common are crystalline associated arthritis. And this usually the most common is gout, which you'll always see as pedagra and then pseudogout. The other second most common one that you'll see is a spondyloarthritis or psoriatic arthritis. And these two diagnoses uh, usually present with Achilles tendonitis and, so, and, and plantar fasciitis as well. And then everyone has seen osteoarthritis of the foot, um, especially with hallux rigidus um, is the most common that I see in rheumatology. And then uh, rheumatoid arthritis can also present in the foot and ankle as well. So I want to focus on two of the main diagnoses that you pretty see a lot, which is the crystalline associated arthritis and the spondyloarthritis and psoriatic arthritis, which is lumped into one diagnosis usually, and, um, and go through like certain diagnostic pearls and physical exam findings in the next slides. So let's move on to gout first. Gout, uh, the most common presentation is pedagra, which you can see here is this erythema. And when you palpate it, it can be uh, very warm and tender and swollen to touch. Um, usually it's always the first MTP, but if someone has gout for a very long time, um, it can spread to the, from the first all the way to the fifth MTP as well. 
Another common manifestation that you'll see is it can manifest in the tibio tailor joint and sometimes even in the Achilles tendon and the peritoneum. On ultrasound, you can actually see deposition of the gout crystals all into the peritoneum of the Achilles tendon. So and when you approach the treatment, when you see pedagra, uh, when you see a swollen foot, um, a lot of the times we think about a septic arthritis, uh, especially if it's monoarticular, because these crystalline arthritides, when they first present, can also be monoarticular. So then we think about it as a septic arthritis. And But uh, at first, I would uh, uh, do treatment with NSAID. Sometimes if you're really sure of the diagnosis, you can do steroids, and then you can refer to rheumatology. So uh, that's a very basic treatment for gout. And uh, that otherwise, uh, when you refer to me, I'll start them probably on urate lowering therapy, which requires a, a really um, uh, an algorithmic approach uh, to treating gout, but it takes uh, a lot of compliance and also um, continuity of care with the patient uh, in order to treat the, their gout and put them on urate lowering therapy like allopurinol. Um, so I wanted to do this pearl on which NSAID should I choose for um, the treating uh, arthritis or in terms of gout. Um, so here you can see that these are all the potential NSAIDs that we can choose from. And there's a lot of them and all of us have our preferences as to which one we like to choose. Um, I typically see a lot of Ketorolac um, from the anesthesiologist. We also like to use Meloxicam a lot here over on the left side of the screen. And this graph here shows the increasing COX inhibition. So over on the right side of the screen, there's increasing COX-1 inhibition. And on the left side of the screen here at the bottom shows increasing COX-2 inhibition. So increasing COX-2 inhibition onto the left side of the screen here are the NSAIDs that will potentially increase the thrombotic risk or the risk of MIs or strokes uh, when you give this medication for the long term. And then on the right side of the screen where you have increasing COX-1 inhibition, you'll have increasing GI bleeding risk. So we typically, oops. So we typically give meloxicam and uh, sometimes celecoxib. I like to choose naproxen a lot more because as you can see, there's, there's not as much COX-1 selectivity inhibition uh, because, and so the, the risk of MIs is much lower, especially in our population who has those risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. And so naproxen doesn't have as much COX-1 selectivity as well, so then the increasing GI risk is mitigated as well. Um, so uh, this is a little pearl uh, in terms of how to choose. And if you can see here, meloxicam and Celebrex, which are the second most other most commonly prescribed medications have increasing thrombotic risk. Um, so the second diagnosis that you'll typically see is pseudogout. Um, and this, I think, is really underrecognized because we typically think of pseudogout as a, a diagnosis where we see in the knees with chondrocalcinosis or in the wrist, but it actually can present also in the ankles a lot as well. So I'm going to go through the epidemiology of pseudogout and how we approach pseudogout in the diagnosis because the presence of chondrocalcinosis may or may not even uh, uh, show that there is a diagnosis of pseudogout. Um, sometimes you can actually see this in the tibio tailor joint as well, where you can see chondrocalcinosis there if you're looking really closely for it. Um, and so usually it's in the chondrocalcinosis in the knees, like I had just said previously, and also in the wrist. Um, but uh, uh, sometimes, a lot of the times, actually, you can see it in the ankles as well. So here's a picture of chondrocalcinosis. This is on um, A is the fibrocartilage um, from the menisci of the knees. Um, and then in C over here, the yellow dots here are the positive birefringent crystals, which are really hard to pick up on synovial fluid. Sometimes it takes two to three aspirations to actually find pseudogout. Um, and, it had, and usually the fluid has a lot of white blood cells, usually greater than 50,000 uh, WBCs. And uh, we always think it's a, a septic arthritic joint when it's monoarticular, but in fact, it could be pseudogout. We just haven't isolated the crystal. 
So there's two types of pseudogout. There's one that's called the acute pseudogout presentation, which is usually a monoarticular arthritis. Um, it's usually found in the knees and it's indistinguishable from gout and, and septic arthritis, which makes a differential diagnosis really hard for us. Um, so that's why sometimes pseudogout might always be in the background of our uh, heads if we go through the differential diagnosis and we actually don't know exactly what, to, the, what actually is treating the patient because the patient continues to have flares despite having a washed out knee or a washed out joint. Um, you have chronic pseudogout, which is indistinguishable from rheumatoid arthritis because sometimes you can have the rheumatoid arthritis distribution and you can see it in the small joints of the foot. You can also see it in the hands. Uh, you can see it in the MTPs. This is someone who's had pseudogout for a very long time already. Um, and so usually this can be caused by gain of function mutations too. So sometimes you don't even expect to see it in an older patient who had an osteoarthritic joint because the A and AH and the ENPP uh, gain of function mutations will predispose a young patient to pseudogout. And I've definitely seen that before. Um, and so uh, the modifiable risk factors that we might see, and then someone might be on the lookout whenever we order a CMP, um, are hypomagnesemia, hypercalcemia, and hypophosphatemia. And then if you get an iron level, which we typically don't order, um, uh, it can also be a risk factor for pseudogout as well. So the treatment of pseudogouts are always glucocorticoids and targeted uh, injections of the joints that cause um, pseudogout. Um, and that can be done by ultrasound guidance, which helps guide you to the area of synovitis, which I'll show you on some images when I talk about um, ultrasound diagnosis of uh, um, certain diseases um, in rheumatology and then NSAIDs as well. There really is not a good treatment for a pseudogout, um, and there really is not any like urate lowering therapy that will get rid of the pseudogout crystals. Hopefully we'll have some sort of therapy in the future as more research is being done. So this is just a pause and um, at the beginning of the presentation, I really enjoy being here in Colorado. This is one of the first hikes that I took here at Chautauqua and the Flat Irons. Um, and I recently did it this weekend as well. And the snow is really nice to go up that one to two peak loop right here, which from looking down is beautiful onto Boulder. So the next manifestation is psoriatic arthritis and spondyloarthritis. So the picture above here shows you toes that are swollen and are not swollen. So um, dactylitis typically affects one to two toes that are more swollen than others. We sometimes may confuse this with maybe even a septic joint or a crystalline associated arthritis like gout. Um, but then in fact, it's actually psoriatic arthritis. Um, so here you can see at the fifth uh, left toe, um, how swollen it is compared to the other toes. And then if you look subtly too, there is some swelling here in the fourth right toe too. And, uh, uh, and so there's just subtleties in the, uh, in the distribution and also the presentation of this. And usually dactylitis is a really um, a telltale sign of psoriatic arthritis or spondyloarthritis. Another presentation of spondyloarthritis or psoriatic arthritis is also Achilles uh, tendon enthesitis. Uh, sometimes we think Achilles tendon tendonitis can be associated just with mechanical tears, especially with plantar fasciitis too, or it could be a mechanical Achilles tendon tear as well. Um, and, but in here, if you look at this picture, the right side is definitely much more swollen than the left side. Um, and then, so in this, in the right clinical context and setting, if the patient has a history of psoriasis or they have back pain or Crohn's disease or inflammatory bowel disease or ulcerative colitis, this could potentially point to the diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis or spondyloarthritis. So a diagnostic pearl, plantar fasciitis may not always be mechanical, um, especially when somebody wakes up with the classic symptoms where their uh, stretching of the feet hurts. Um, uh, and in the morning, it's worse when they, they, uh, they put the bare weight onto their feet. Think about sometimes psoriatic arthritis or spondyloarthritis and think about whether or not uh, they meet the triad or have other risk factors like 
inflammatory bowel disease or uh, lower back pain like ankylosing spondylitis or they have psoriasis. Sometimes uh, with the physical, oh, so a good screener for psoriatic arthritis is looking for inflammatory back pain. And inflammatory back pain is back pain that's not mechanical where these symptoms occur, where the back pain starts earlier than 40 years of age. The back pain wakes you up at night the pain improves, this is a hallmark symptom with movement and exercise because mechanical back pain will always um, hurt more when you uh, move, uh, move your joints, whereas inflammatory back pain will uh, improve when you move your joints more. Um, a significant morning stiffness that's associated with this and all these features will lump you into the spondyloarthritis category of psoriatic arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease and ankle posting spondylitis. So that's a good screener question, especially when you see your patient, the quick question you can say, to, does your joint pain improve with movement or exercise? So uh, the other clinical pearls in uh, history and exam that you can quickly do when you're doing the exam for the patient, when you see dactylitis or Achilles tendonitis is looking for these things like psoriasis or um, other evidence of uveitis in your eye. So more dactylitis of the hands, you could just, you could look up and look at the hands as well. And then, um, uh, and you'll see the dactylitis usually in the hands as well as in the toes. Um, you'll see palmar psoriasis. Sometimes it's postular psoriasis. So any kind of skin rash on the palms is something. And then there's something called keratoderma blenorragicum, which is a part of Reiter's disease or reactive arthritis. Um, and it, it looks, it's a, a thickening of the skin. So whenever you see these systemic signs, you, it points towards a diagnosis of spondyloarthritis. So this was a hike that I did in Rocky Mountain National Park in early January where the um, little hike to Emerald Lake. And this is, I think, Dream Lake. I didn't realize that you could actually walk on the ice um, and also go ice skating as well. Uh, and here's some pictures of some people that I uh, caught where that were skating and playing hockey on Dream Lake in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, so I wanted to move on to talk about the value of diagnostic ultrasound here. This was my mentor here at MGH, and we did conferences when I was there um, where we would uh, show, uh, show other physicians how to use ultrasound and use diagnostic ultrasound at the, uh, at the bedside as well. Um, so the advantage of uh, doing musculoskeletal ultrasound is that there, in 2008 Medicare data, we found that 30% of all diagnoses could be made by ultrasound instead of ordering the MRI. We also found that ultrasound has higher spatial resolution than MR imaging, which can be really helpful in evaluating the really superficial joints, um, especially the toes. Um, and then ultrasound uh, is a dynamic process and it helps uh, in a differentiating pattern and can sometimes even see tears as well and minor tears that aren't even picked up by the MRI. And then the clinical correlation helps the patient identify uh, because it's a bedside procedure and you as the physician are doing it at the same time allows you to see um, the certain, uh, the patient to direct you to the certain spot that is hurting them and then seeing if there's actually pathology. And then you can use ultrasound to compare the contralateral knee or the contralateral ankle or the contralateral toe as well. Um, and ultrasound um, uh, answers the question really immediately at the bedside, whereas MRI goes through the process of insurance approval and uh, um, going through the process of prior approval and sometimes even needing a peer-to-peer. Um, and then ultrasound also costs a lot less than MRI significantly. So it's a much added advantage. So that's why I think um, this uh, kind of um, uh, also advocates for using ultrasound as the earlier diagnosis before we move on to an MRI. So here's an example, uh, here's some images of ultrasound that I do daily in my practice. So this is the tibia and then also the talus in a long view right here. Um, and this is just the normal uh, uh, anatomy. And then on this here on the horizontal axis, you can see the tibialis anterior, as well as the extensor hallucis longus and the extensor digitorum longus, and then the joint capsule as well. And then um, here you can also, and then so in here is, pathology. And then this is where it's fun to see because you see this area, this black area right here where I'm pointing at the mouse is an 
anechoic area found on ultrasound at the tibia right here on the left side and then the talus right here. Um, and you can see the, um, the cartilage on top of it as well. And this is synovitis or it could be an effusion. Um, if you push on the ultrasound probe and this uh, area of black goes away, then it's more likely an effusion. And then here you can see it, uh, appreciate it on the horizontal axis where this area of black above the, um, the talus uh, can be seen as well on ultrasound. And then so how, uh, what's fun about uh, this is you can use the ultrasound to guide your needle to the right location if you think this is an effusion, because this could be pseudogout, it could be gout, it could be a septic joint, um, and based on your clinical history, and then you can, by aspirating, you can see and it can guide you to the exact location of it. And so you would come in here with the uh, angle of the needle and then into the area, the anechoic area on ultrasound, and then attempt to aspirate the joint. And if you aspirate the joint too, and you don't get any fluid, then it's more likely synovitis, which then could be from rheumatoid arthritis as well. Um, so this is more uh, photos of doing it uh, on the horizontal axis approach. And then here's some fun pictures where you can see gout crystals in the joint. And I love uh, doing this diagnosis all the time because patients can actually see it at the bedside. Um, so here is an example of the posterior tibial uh, tendon um, and on the medial side of the ankle. And uh, you can see the tendon here attaching onto the navicular. And uh, um, right here is the uh, aggregates of crystals that you can see. So there's a tendonitis that's, a, that's going on right now because of this area of black that you see around the ankle um, and also the aggregates of crystals within the joint. Um, here in the tibial tailored joint, a very specific specific uh, sign for gout is the double contour sign, which is uh, where the uric acid crystals deposit on the hyaline cartilage above the talus. And so you can see these two lines here that make the double contour and it's very, very specific for, room, uh, sorry, for gout. Um, and so uh, that's a, uh, it's a fun finding to find on um, ultrasound. I typically see that uh, the double contour sign only uh, occurs more often in long-standing gout, more so than early gout. Um, and then here is uh, uh, in the first MTP joint, the gout aggregates uh, um, that you can see, uh, I believe this is uh, at the first MTP joint from the, um, the dorsal surface of the foot. Uh, and you can see these hypercolored aggregates as well right here, and then these stippling densities. Pseudogout looks similar, but it's more of a smudge, what I usually call it. Here you have more stippling density, there's more white areas. Pseudogout will have more of a smudge appearance. It'll be a homogenous gray. Um, and then here uh, is another double contour sign, but on the plantar, uh, I'm sorry, this is at the femur actually. Uh, and so, uh, but to, for us, we'll focus on uh, knee an uh, an ankle and foot arthritis. Um, here's Achilles uh, tendonitis and enthesitis. So this is the calcaneus right here on the bottom. You can see some of these enthesophytes that are forming right here where the calcaneus is not a nice uh, straight line. Um, you can see here also above the cartilage um, that there is an anechoic area, which is the inflammation seen in the Achilles tendon as it is attaching onto the calcaneus. Um, and then here, if you turn on power Doppler, you can see the inflammation occurring. And then you can usually look at the retrocalcaneal bursa right here too, where the arrow is pointing to, and uh, you can see this anechoic area, which means that it's being, it's also inflamed as well. You can also use ultrasound to diagnose gout here and then crystalline deposition. If you trace the, uh, if you follow the probe up, higher or up more superiorly towards the calf, you can look at the parotene and usually that's a very uh, common area to have uh, crystals deposit into the around the tendon. And you can also diagnose tendon tears. I've had a couple runners, um, not so much here, but uh, um, in Boston, we had runners come in um, and there would be minor tears that you can diagnose on the Achilles tendon. Um, so here is uh, um, uh, evidence of other things that you can do too with ultrasound. You could see really minor stress fractures. So here on the left side of the screen, this is the metatarsal. Um, to the left of the screen is more proximal, to the right of the screen is more distal in the foot. And you can see right here this um, 
step up the formality right here, where it's not one straight homogeneous line. And that's the minor stress fracture that can be seen. And this wasn't actually picked up. This was a patient of mine in Boston. And uh, it wasn't actually picked up on x-ray by a radiologist, uh, nor on the MRI. And the patient kept on having a lot of foot pain. Um, here uh, is uh, where the I believe is the, PT, uh, the PTT attaching onto the navicular bone. And uh, we can see here this little deformity right here where we can see this minor stress fracture as well. Oh, wait, no, no, it's not a fracture. <laughs> and it's a normal accessory bone of the navicular. Um, and then on the right side of the screen here, uh, we have the uh, Lisfranc fracture that we could typically see, uh, where it's at the second metatarsal in the medial uh, cuneiform. Um, and so you can see right here on ultrasound where the medial cuneiform is, and uh, oh, sorry, the, sorry, the left of the screen is the metatarsal and the cuneiform. And then you can see this defect right here for the Lisfranc fracture. Um, so I just wanted to wrap up and say thank you. Um, thank you for having me today. And I look forward to working with you all. And if you have any questions, just message me in secure um, chat on, on Epic or email me, or you can also direct message me on Twitter to uh, Jonathan Dow, MD. Jonathan, thanks so much. That was a great overview. Do, do you do the diagnostic ultrasound? I mean, is that, is that a kind of a part of your workup? Yes, I do. I do the diagnostic ultrasound at the bedside whenever the patient comes in, um, and uh, uh, and I can diagnose any of these um, uh, things that I have talked about today. That's great. Well, I think you know, you know, obviously we have a really good partnership with rheumatology, um, just because there's so much overlap in patients. So we appreciate having you here as a you know as a resource and someone we can refer patients to for management and. You know, vice versa, obviously, we have you know, orthopedic surgeons and podiatrists, you know, at our at our foot and ankle center, as well as non-operative, you know, sports medicine and and uh, and um, uh, uh, PM and R docs. So, um, yeah, we, we're, we're happy to collaborate on on patients and you know, potentially research down the road. Um, yeah, that would be wonderful. Any any, uh, any questions for, for Dr. Dow from the group? Ken, hi, it's Paul, Dr. Back East. Hey, Paul. What's the level of teaching for med students and residents for ultrasound these days? Are there requirements for the boards, et cetera? Uh, most recently, in rheumatology uh, ACGME requirements, uh, we have uh, introduced a milestone for that as well. Um, it's fairly new in rheumatology. I know that there's a lot of uh, point of care ultrasound that's done in the emergency room. Um, and uh, it's also done a lot in the PMR training um, in their residency programs as well. Ken, are you using it much in clinic for diagnosis <laughs> in clinic? You know, I, I don't, Paul. I'm not, I'm not skilled enough as a diagnostician. You know, we do have a very nice ultrasound unit at the Foot and Ankle Center that I use for some guided injections um you know like particularly like posterior tibial tendon and uh and perineal tendons um and, and that's about the extent of my my skill i just don't have enough confidence in differentiating uh -huh. tissues the way jonathan just described um to do it to do a diagnostic ultrasound but that's why we have you know uh -huh. people like like jonathan cool but just just on that topic um there's that, that technology is really moving quickly. And I don't know, Jonathan, if you're aware of this, but I, you know, somebody had shared with me that the quality of the ultrasound units coming out are like rivaling MRI in terms of resolution. Oh, yes. So yes. I, yeah. So I, I think that's a, that's something that for, you know, for our trainees and, and even faculty, you know, having that ability in clinic to inexpensively, you know, get high resolution images is going to, be a game changer, I think. Yes, seeing the tears right away in clinic are very, very uh, helpful. I think in the in the diagnosis, not diagnostic component, instead of waiting for the MRI. And yes, there are machines now that have such clarity, and there's also a lot of portable ones too. Um, I think here at UC Health, we uh, um, contract with GE. 
Um, and so there's a new GE logic machine that has come out um, that has great diagnostic clarity um, and also has this new um, formatting uh, that they introduced that helps actually uh, identify inflammation even easier than the power uh, Doppler. John, do you have any slides or video you might share just how it's used to do an injection? What, what, um, what it yes, actually looks do. like to do an injection? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I have some that I can share. Great. Oh, what kind of injections? Which joints? Oh, just or tendons. Subtalar, ankle, okay, toe, yeah. or tendons, perineals, etc. Definitely, yeah. Uh, thank you. Or just direct me where to where to look. It's fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Jonathan. It's Teresa Albert, the orthotist on the team. So um, on one hand, we say motion is lotion for, you know, arthritis, right, for the foot and ankle. And on the other hand, we want to kind of stabilize it and, um, you know, limit. Like, do, you, do you have a, a reference or preference to what the protocol on that is? Should it be just short term, temporary? Uh, what's your feedback for that? I think in inflammatory arthritis, the first component is controlling the inflammation. So that's with the many biologics that we have now to choose from um, and drugs to calm the inflammation. Um, I find that patients tend to do uh, physical therapy and overdo it in the early phases. And I think that contributes more to pain for them more so than it actually helps them. I think once we calm down the inflammation in about two to three months over a six month period, then we can introduce phys uh, physical therapy and have the motion um, that, that uh, you were talking about, Teresa, um, and into their you know, stretches and exercises. And then that will actually help them more so than doing it early on in their diagnosis. And, and bracing and stabilization like with AFOs or orthotics or ankle braces? I think initially uh, braces would be helpful, um, but afterwards over time, then that's when stretching is more helpful. Okay, oh, other, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, go yes. ahead. Um, I'm one of the uh, fellows, thanks for your, uh, thanks for that presentation yeah, we see friend. um we see a number of of patients with with heel pain you know on a, on a daily basis mm -hmm. and most of the time we're we chalk it up to uh or at least our our leading differential is always like a mechanical source you know so like these insertional achilles um um type scenarios do you have any i guess working up a patient with with kind of intractable heel pain where we've been thinking it's mechanical source, you know, they have the, the kind of the, the, the bump and pain right at their insertion. Besides like a, a history of psoriatic arthritis that would kind of potentially tip us off mm -hmm. to being like some sort of other, you know, enthesitis, what are your, what are your pearls for, for kind of differentiating a, a mechanical problem versus a inflammatory problem? Yeah, I think uh, for that, because um, an osteophyte from osteoarthritis in a calcaneal spur is very common in the differential diagnosis as well. So a distinguish between that versus inflammatory arthritis is the, um, the, the holy grail, essentially. So I think the one pearl for that in the clinical history is how active they are and their age. So if... Um, they present to you with a calcaneal spur at the age of 60 or 70 like that, that's more likely osteoarthritis. But if they present to you earlier on, like less than the age of 40 or something like that, then that's more so an Achilles tendonitis enthesitis with an enthesophyte um, rather than a mechanical arthritis or osteoarthritis. Okay. Dr. Dow, thanks for the, the talk on the, one of the residents. Um, I just had a quick question about 
um, the, the gout information. Mm -hmm. There's there's a dichotomy between gout management in the emergency department and in the in the clinic setting. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes, we're called to rule out an infected uh, or septic joint um, in in the presence of a, a positive gout history. And um, in my understanding is even if the aspirate, the preliminary results of the aspirate are more consistent with crystal arthropathy so that, you know, gram stain is negative, positive crystals. Um, it's really the, the inflammatory process that might be cytotoxic to the chondrocytes. So my question is in that setting, when we aspirate a joint in a patient with a history of gout, the preliminary results are consistent with gout and we are waiting for uh, the culture results. If they have an extremely high PMNs, mm -hmm. um, would you recommend um, adding steroids in addition to NSAIDs in that setting or, or keep it safe and just do NSAIDs and wait for the cultures? Yeah, so that's where um, clinical um, acumen and experience and even the most seasoned physician will sometimes even not uh, might catch accidentally think it's crystalline arthritis versus a septic joint. Um, I know, so in your clinical case, um, you had said that uh, the crystals were identified already. Um, I would just stick to an NSAID at that point and just a high dose NSAID. I like to use naproxen because um, it has less COX-1 inhibition nor COX-2 inhibition. Um, and so you can use that while you're waiting for the cultures to result within 24 to 48 hours. But if they have a clinical presentation in the joints, especially in the foot that are very classic for gout, then that's when I would move on to steroids because steroids will always help. Um, but I would never uh, combine the two uh, steroids or an NSAID at the same time because that can uh, increase the risk of GI bleeding, which I've seen happen a lot of times for some patients. Okay, any other questions? Jonathan, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. That was a great, uh, great presentation, a great discussion. Um, we'll, we'll definitely keep you in mind as we're you know, referring patients to rheumatology. Um, and uh, if there's anything else we can, uh, you know, we can answer for you, we'd, we'd love to have you engage this group. Um, you know, if, uh, if you have any questions of us or if we can be, be helpful in any way. Um, of course, you have uh, Dr. Jameson uh, there um, yeah, at, yeah. Uh, at Cherry Creek. So you've got a, an, an outstanding foot and ankle resource uh, right down the hall um, as well. Uh, yeah. Um, and ultimately, when it becomes a, a little bit more uh, acceptable to have people walk into buildings, um, we'd love to have you out to the foot and ankle center and, and take a tour of the facility and kind of see what, uh, you know, see what we have to offer there. Yeah, I'd love to. And if anybody wants to, um, or Julie would like to come out to, to shadow me as well and to watch ultrasound um, and potentially learn, I am very open to having. Actually, that's a that's a great idea. We may take you up on that offer. You know, particularly for our fellows, because um, we're trying to broaden their exposure to, you know, things other than just just orthopedic surgery. Um, and that might be really helpful. So what would that look like, Johnny? Like a half a day where they spend some time with you? Yeah, definitely. Okay, what days are you in clinic? I am in clinic Tuesday through Friday. Okay, excellent. 8 a.m. Yeah, we'll uh, enjoy it at any time. Yeah, I appreciate that. We'll, we'll keep that in mind and, and I'll, I'll reach out once we see how we can incorporate it, but that would be really helpful. Yeah. All right, John, oh. do you go by Jonathan or John or? Uh, I go by Jonathan or John, either okay. one. <laughs> yeah, and well, please great. my first name. All right, Jonathan. Well, great, uh, great having you. Great, great having you in our system, and really appreciate you having you being here this morning. Yeah. All right, thank you.